class and welcome to chapter 7. And this is what, week 5 I think? Man, this, these 8 weeks are going by really, really, really quickly. Um, week 7, knowledge management. You know, this has been a very good topic for me. And I will pre-warn you. I'm going to pre-warn you right now. This is almost going to be a Bible study. So, just uh, in case you want to turn the uh, <laughs> video off now. Because when I started thinking about knowledge, it really uh, had me go into the source of knowledge. But that's what we're going to talk about today, is knowledge management. And some of the things that go along with that. Now, I love this saying by Don uh, Dave Snowden who is the founder and chief uh, scientific officer for a company called uh, Cognitive Edge. He says, we always know more than we can tell. And we always tell more than we can write. Which means that we have a lot of things in our head. The problem is getting it down on paper. Um, so, and that's kind of sometimes even the things with knowledge. All right, let's get into this. If you remember from week one, uh, I shared this, this model with you. Right, what I call the DIKW maturity model, the data information knowledge wisdom model. And we, in the first week, we talked about data and how we use networks to move data around and do things with data. And then we had data once we uh, have it, now we, we move it up and we bring data together and we make information with that and we, we're able to obtain information. Well, now with that information, now we want to be able to bring information from many sources sometimes and synthesize that to what we call knowledge. And that's where we're at now. And really that takes us to wisdom, wisdom and understanding. And those tie very closely together. You know, I love that scripture, Hosea 4 and 6. It says, what my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge, not having knowledge. Not that they didn't have information, had lots of information, but they didn't have knowledge. And we're going to probably go into that a little deeper uh, as we go through this. So let's look at the definition for knowledge. Uh, and this definition comes from two uh, Japanese business experts, and I am not even going to try to pronounce their names. That's why I highlighted them, so you can you can try that yourself. Uh, and what they did, they were looked at. They were one of some of the uh, first to look at the ties between uh, the success of Japanese companies and and how their and their ability to create new knowledge and to use it in their uh, be able to, be, to be able to produce uh, successful products and technologies. And uh, Nonaka, he defined knowledge as being justified true belief. And he considers knowledge as a, listen to this, a dynamic human process of justifying personal beliefs as part of an aspiration for the truth. So I don't know how we can talk about knowledge. And even these Japanese who, I don't know what their religious backgrounds are, but they understand that knowledge and truth and personal beliefs are all intertwined together. And so how can you talk about knowledge without talking about the creator of knowledge, God? So this is why, to me, this discussion is so dynamic. <clears throat> so when we think about knowledge, two types, two types of knowledge that we deal with, tactic knowledge and explicit knowledge. Now when we think about tactic knowledge, that's that knowledge that we have internally, things that we know, very personal, and it's hard to formalize, it's, it's sometimes it's reasoning, logic, some, all these things that, that we use to make decisions that sometimes isn't um, always uh, very analytical because sometimes it's based on emotions, it's based on human belief. It's our ability to adapt, the ability to change. Whereas explicit knowledge, actually that's the rational part of our knowledge. That's the things that we can capture and we can document and we can, we can put that into um, um, products and, and that, that makes it easy for us to train and to, uh, to teach other people. Uh, but so, so when we think about tactic knowledge, you know, that's that thing that's, that's rooted in the individual's actions and our, experiment, and our experiences. And it's part of our, our culture, part of our values, part of our emotions. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, the three parts of man, uh, the mind, soul, spirit. So that's what that tactic is. But now when we're able to communicate that, that becomes explicit knowledge. Um, as, as, a, as a teacher, I can relate to this because I have a lot of things inside that when I try to use analogies. Basically, I'm trying to use an analogy to take tactic knowledge that I've gained over the years with experience and things like that, and then to try to communicate that via some type of analogy to, to, so it becomes explicit knowledge. So now as a student or as a class, you're able to grasp it and you're able to 
be taught and be trained. So that's hopefully that uh, makes sense to you. Tactic knowledge, explicit knowledge. So now we understand what knowledge is. Let's kind of move into a definition for knowledge management, KM. Now, I'm just going to read this right off the slide, right off the slide, right here. Knowledge management is what? It is the art of transforming information and intellectual assets into enduring value for an organization's clients and its piece of people. That's a very nice, clean, pristine business um, oriented definition. So when we look at the purpose of what we call knowledge management, it's like this, what, the false to the reuse of intellectual capital. Um, yeah, so, so when we mean by that, if you look at an organization, there's a lot of intellectual capital. People, many have been there for years and years and years, who have all this knowledge, inherent knowledge and wisdom. Now, how do we reuse that? How do we, before that individual retires with 40 years of grateful service to an organization, that we're able to capitalize Capitalize that knowledge and be able to reuse it, uh, <clears throat> that intellectual capital, with others coming into the organization. We always think about knowledge as it uh, um, influences decision making. Um, in the military, this is what we used to call decision superiority, meaning that with the right amount of not just information, but with the right amount of knowledge, now our leaders, leadership, the generals, and, and everyone are able to have decision superiority over the enemy, over an adversary. And that's what we always strive to do, especially now as we go into this, what we call kind of the knowledge age. If you think about it, we started out with what, an agricultural society, then we moved into an industrial society, and many people now think that we are now moving more into what we call an information age or a knowledge age, an age of knowledge and wisdom. Ah, yeah, give or take on that one. But you see, that's kind of a definition that's out there for KM, knowledge management. But you know, I like Peter Drucker's definition. If you're not familiar with Peter Drucker, definitely do a little reading on him. He is one of the, he is one of the leading uh, business strategists uh, and uh, leadership management individuals you know, like within uh, the 20th, 21st century. It says, you can't manage knowledge. Knowledge is between two ears and only between two ears. So yeah, so I, 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 I do, I, I, I gravitate to that definition because knowledge is something you can't manage. Now what we do like to try to do with manage is to try to share it. But in the process of that, we fall, most of the time we fall into a very faulty uh, knowledge management paradigm. Because what we want to try to do with it, we want to try to write your knowledge in a database and try to get enough level of granularity in that database. And then what happens, well then maybe somebody will use it someday, maybe not. Because that's been kind of the problem. Because when we think about knowledge, um, it helps to have an audience. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Someone who's willing to use the knowledge. Otherwise, it becomes kind of vain, um, vain within itself. So, along the way, now many people think that, well, you know what, we've got social media, social, me social media software to the rescue. Is that the answer? No, social media, what is that? It's really just tools. It's just a set of tools, whether we're talking about wikis, or whether we're talking about blogs, or any of your social media uh, uh, outlets of software. You know, those are just tools. They really don't help you share knowledge. They're make, they can become good portals for information. And, and why? Because, here again, we have tons and tons of, uh, we have petabytes of, of data written in wikis, blogs, websites, you name it. But unless someone reads that, unless someone takes that data, that information, and consume it, we haven't done really anything as far as um, managing knowledge or doing knowledge sharing. Because one of the things, I don't like this, what we call the 99-1 rule. And this has to do with uh, the web, the internet. It says 1% of all web users create the majority of the content. 1%. 9% of web users comment and tag information. 90% of web users only consume information. So when you think about that, and you, and you scale those numbers down to an organization, so how many of the knowledge holders in an organization are the 1%? Meaning that how many of the, the people who really have uh, a level of knowledge of what's going on in that company, in that industry, uh, is actually the ones that are sharing that knowledge? 
is the one percent that's actually creating uh, content. Maybe not a lot. So what you've got then is you know that, that inverted pyramid where 90% of the users are trying to use information or knowledge that's not being shared by the 1%. So when we think about knowledge sharing, gosh, what a great segue. I love that, especially when they're accidental. Uh, knowledge sharing is, is what? It's always what, voluntarily. You, you cannot be forced to share your knowledge. Information, yeah, we, we can, we can have information, you know, stacked everywhere. We can have data landfills and, and everything where we can share data and we can share uh, information. But knowledge, the holder of knowledge and wisdom, is always voluntary for you to share that. Now, we share knowledge when we have the right audience. And I think that's the critical part. I probably should have highlighted that and put it in bold with, uh, you know, parentheses around it. Because when you have the right audience, that motivates an individual with knowledge to create content and to put context to that content. Meaning that, you know, I have my own website. Well, what makes it valuable for a website is when, when I get an audience or someone responds back, hey, uh, I enjoyed that thing, uh, that music or the video, because now I have an audience. So when I have an audience, now I'm motivated to create more content. I'm motivated now to share more knowledge. When a student asks a question, that motivates me now to try to take more of my tactic knowledge and convert it to explicit knowledge and share with that individual because I have an audience. So social software, social media software alone is not the solution to the problems of knowledge management. Now, let's get into like the, the, the part of the kind of the Bible study parts. Now, you look at the prophets in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, the prophets in the Bible. You know, they were given a lot of spiritual knowledge directly from God through visions and dreams, and, and, and angels would you know would would come and, and speak to these 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 men. But it's really you know from the mouth of God. But they had, had a very difficult time sharing the knowledge. Why? because they did not have an audience. You look at Jeremiah and Isaiah, Ezekiel, all these guys, they, they were speaking with the oracles of God, but the people still perished due to a lack of knowledge. And not because the knowledge wasn't there, it's because they weren't attentive. And you probably heard these scriptures that their ears had waxed cold, you know, that their hearts were hard, they were stiff necked, all these things mean that, that they were not an attentive audience. So no matter how much the prophet spoke, the people still perished. Not that it wasn't available, but they were an unwilling audience. Thing to remember when we talk about knowledge in the workplace, same thing. To have knowledge transfer, we have to be able to have an audience that's ready to receive. Okay, makes sense? I love that scripture in Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, 15. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. Meaning that they are an attentive audience. That's what, that's what uh, Solomon is, is making that point, that they are, they are an attentive audience. Now, let's talk about this, you know, and do a contrast compare between information management and knowledge management. Why? Because in most organizations, we start out on a path of, yeah, we know we need to, to share knowledge, but really it boils, it, many times it just uh, boils down to becoming more information management. So if we look at information management, some of the characteristics of information management, you know, information management Information can can easily can be easily organized and distributed. Under KM, knowledge resides where in one's mind. It's human centric. It's not technology centric. Uh, information management rely on the technical achievements to enable knowledge sharing. You know, we got websites, we got uh, networks, we have all these things set up. Whereas knowledge management relies on the willingness of individuals to share it. Yeah, I think, uh, now we think about IM, information management uses what, firewalls, permissions, access levels, all these things that we set up in our networks so that we can control information, who can get the information, who can. Whereas with knowledge management, we is, uh, use the retention policies and the ability to circulate that knowledge within an organization. So when you think about information management, knowledge management, hopefully you see where the two are, are not the same. 
They're not the same. And because sometimes KM is difficult, we just end up reverting back to an enhanced version of I am, information management and organizations, when really our goal was to set out to do uh, knowledge management. Now, we're going to shift gears because this is something I read the other day and it just really spoke to me with respect to knowledge. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is in Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 2. If you're not familiar with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was uh, uh, the ruler of Babylon, the king of Babylon. At that time, that was the dynasty that, that basically controlled the the. the the known world at that time. Well, <clears throat> and this is right after uh, Nebuchadnezzar had gone and uh, captured Judah and had brought some of the uh, the, the 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 wealthy, the rich uh, men, women, children. He didn't bring them all of uh, Israel, but some of the select ones he brought. And Daniel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We all know those uh, by those names. That's not their actual names, but uh, they were brought there. So anyway, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream, had a vision. Actually, God spoke to him in a dream. Now, and the, he, and the king had, yes, he had some magicians and sorcerers, and their job was to interpret dreams. But evidently in the past, if you should read chapter 2, they had been giving him some faulty information. They were telling him things that weren't true and weren't coming to pass. So he put them to the test. He said, I want you to in interpret my dream, but I want you to also tell me what the dream was. Ooh. And, it's, you know, and they were like, king, no one on this earth can do that. They're, you know, Just tell us what your dream was, what, you, what the vision was, and we will interpret it. He said, no. As a matter of fact, if you can't tell me what my dream was and then interpret it, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to you know, you turn your, your houses into rubble. Because it was. It was impossible. Here's why it was impossible. The king right here. He wanted knowledge without providing information. The sorcerers, they were all saying, well, give us some information and then we'll take the information and we'll regurgitate it back to you in the form of some type of knowledge. And, you know, if you look at our little pyramid here, you see, so now we're trying to get to this level, this rung of the, of the inverted uh, pyramid, without these two bottom supporting uh, rungs of the ladder. Information was, I mean, knowledge was not preceded with information. So now they had a really proverbial knowledge management issue going on. Well, Daniel, <clears throat> because he was also on the king's staff, he was in line also to get killed, as long as, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So when uh, the officer came to Daniel, let him know that, hey guys, you guys get ready to get uh, killed. And Daniel, like, why? Well, because the king had a dream and none of you guys could interpret it. And Daniel said, wait a minute, give us a chance, give us an opportunity. He went to the king, said, king, give us a chance, give us a little time, we'll work this thing out. And why was he able to, to make that statement? Because Daniel knew the source of knowledge. He knew God. And Daniel prayed a very interesting prayer in uh, chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this. He says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and season. He disposes kings and he raises others up. And he says this, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within him. I thank and praise you, God, of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the king, the dream of the king. He prayed this prayer right after the, the, the next morning after he had woken up because God had given him the revelation. God had given him the knowledge. Just like Peter Drucker said, God had put it between those two ears. He had put it in Daniel's heart. Not only the dream and the vision, but also the interpretation. And Daniel, before he ran back to the king, he took the time to stop and pray this prayer because he understood that even he told the king, said, King, when he got to see Nebuchadnezzar, what you're asking is impossible for humans on this planet. But 
I know a God, my God, he knows all things, meaning that he knows that he has a source of knowledge. And if you, you know, read on in chapter 2, and then the, and Daniel gives the interpretation, he gives him the dreams, you know, that you dreamed about this statue, and this statue head was made of gold, his uh, uh, chest was made of silver, chest arms made of silver, his waist thigh was made of brass, and legs were made of iron, and the feet were part iron and part clay. And what that and he then he interpreted that, that these are the kingdoms of the world. So Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head, you're gold. And who's going to follow you later on is going to be the Medio Persian Empire, and they were represented by silver. And who followed them, who's going to overthrow them was Alexander the Great, Greece, uh, who was the the, the, the the brass. And the legs of steel, that would be Rome. Rome came in and overthrew Greece. And, and then he also told him, said, in your dream, you saw this stone cut out of a mountain and, was, and it hit the feet of this thing, of this, and it crumbled. And the, but the stone didn't. And that was also Daniel saying that Jesus is coming. That the, the, the next kingdom that's coming is a stone that's not made by hands. It's a kingdom that's not built by hands, not built on earth by man. And so Daniel did that. It's because Daniel knew that God had the knowledge. And he knew the source of knowledge. And you may say, okay, great Bible study. Thank you very much. I don't have to go to Bible study this Wednesday. But what does this have to do with this class? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about godly knowledge, and let's now transfer this to the workplace, to the marketplace. Because many times, age, when you move into the workplace, you know we're often going to be asked to do things that will appear impossible, because we won't always have the information that we need. Just like, just like the sorcerers and the astrologers, they didn't have the information they needed to make uh, to have decision superiority, in order to provide. A, a, a level of knowledge to the king. And these things happen every day in our workplace. Why? Because many times, accurate information is not available. You know, and we just don't have enough data points that at the time we think to make decisions. Or we may work in an environment where we, where we have what I call information hoarders. These are people who just like to hold on to information because it makes me look good and when I get the right audience, meaning, you know, my supervisor, my chain of command, then I I'm going to release this knowledge, this information, so it makes me look good uh, in the sight of man. Or there may be a lack of information sharing that happens in a lot of uh, our organizations. So what do you do in those situations? Well, we should do just like Daniel did, even in, especially in the workplace. Because if you think about Daniel, Daniel wasn't in church. He wasn't uh, in worship when these things were happening. He was a, an advisor to the king. That was his job. We don't, I think that's the time we not, may not realize that, but yeah, Daniel was at work, and he, but he brought his godly concepts into the workplace. So sometimes we have to also be able to call on the, on the, the creator and the inventor of knowledge. Um, so we should never forget who the source of knowledge is. That is, it's always God. And, and, and he made that well known throughout the Bible, many places. Really, he started right there in creation. Where? In Genesis chapter 2, with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Many times people leave that word out. They just say it was the tree of good and evil. No, it was the tree of the knowledge, meaning the awareness. Now we're talking about awareness um, of good and evil. Uh, during the building of the tabernacle, if you go to Exodus chapter 31, and um, God told Moses, I have put into the to the heart of these uh, the, uh, certain people, they have the knowledge to be able to do skilled things with iron and brass and silver. All the all the things you're going to need to be able to do to build a tabernacle. God placed that knowledge in their heart. So He told Moses, "Go find these these particular people. They've got that knowledge." Solomon and his leadership abilities, because early on, even though Solomon was a young boy, he went to God for knowledge. He said, "God." Please give me the knowledge and the wisdom to lead your people. And, and that was when God told him, Solomon, ask what you will of me. And, and God said, well, because you didn't ask for real riches and, and all of these things, I'm going to give you that type of knowledge. Uh, also, Job. Have you ever read the book of Job? Chapter 36 through 42. As Job, before Job was restored, 
he had a lesson in knowledge, in godly knowledge. God had to kind of humble him and break him down and say, hey, look, you know, where were you, Job, when I created the earth and, and I put Leviathan in the ocean? He means that you don't have the knowledge that you think you do. So Job had a growing experience with knowledge. You go throughout the Psalms, throughout the Proverbs, it's always talking about knowledge, knowledge. The list goes on and on. So with that said, so where should our trust be? Technology or trusting God's word? Yes, we have to deal with technology. Now, I know if you look at the rest of this, this particular week, uh, you know, we're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, virtual reality, informatics, you know, neural networks, where we got networks now trying to th think and reason like the human brain. Uh, I see machine learning, where you know, you got robotics that are learning to do things similar to uh, the human anatomy and, and human thought patterns. But when it still comes to knowledge, that still comes from God. Because I love Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if you want to know where knowledge starts, it's right there in the fear of the Lord. And, and be ready to take that into wherever you may end up in your career path, um, whether it's in information systems management, uh, medical, wherever, understand that, that the source of knowledge is always from God. Hey, listen, thank you very much. I know I said earlier, I preface it. This is going to sound like a Bible study, but how can you talk about things like ethics, or how can you talk about subjects like knowledge without bringing in the source, the author, and the finisher of those things, who is God? Thank you. Have a good week. Have any questions, please uh, email or text, call. We'll uh, respond as quickly as possible. Have a nice week. God bless.